but let us continue to look to you. Hallelujah. Look to your son and what he's done for us at Calvary's cross so that we can come to you and receive everything that we have need of. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Our cry tonight should be change my heart, oh God. I know there's things in my heart that God needs to change. Hallelujah. And I'm crying tonight. Change my heart, oh God. Let that be our cry tonight. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for your spirit, Lord God. Just we can sit so heavily in this place tonight. Hallelujah. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh you Lord God I can just sense his presence so strong tonight let's just lift up our hands and let's just magnify him let's just begin to worship him tell him tonight to change our hearts each and every single one of us those listening by internet those here including myself we need the Lord to change our heart let's sing this one more time hallelujah I'm so thankful tonight that we have a God that's able to change hearts hallelujah the only God Hallelujah. And only by the way of the cross is he able to change our hearts. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be loved.
Lord God. Mold us and make us after your will. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That should be all our prayers. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If we can open up our Bibles tonight to 1 Corinthians, and we'll finish up with chapter 3 tonight. And let's just start in verse 16. Praise the Lord. If you're tuning in by internet, we just welcome you tonight. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. When you have it, you can either stand or just say, Amen. Praise the Lord. Everybody have it. And the Bible reads, Know you not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, for he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He takes the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apostle or Cephas or the world of life or death or things present or all things to come, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you, and Father, thank you for your presence here tonight. Oh, Lord, let us be holy in your sight. Lord, cover us in the blood of the Lamb, Father. Lord, let us be a temple for your Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord, when the world sees us, Father, let them see your Son, Jesus Christ, and what he did at the cross, Lord. Lord, when you look at our nation, Lord, let you see the blood of the Lamb, Lord. Let you see the faith of your born-again believers, Lord. Be covered by the spotless, the Lamb of God, Father. And Lord, we just love you. We thank you. There's not enough words to praise your holy name, Father. Lord, we just ask that you touch hearts and lives tonight, Father. Lord, let a mighty move of your Spirit cover this nation once again, Lord. Lord, let righteousness rise up. Let holiness rise up, Lord. Let the blood of the Lamb rise up once again in this nation, Lord, in churches again, Lord. Father, we'll give you all the praise and glory. Lord, you're worthy of it. In Jesus' name, Lord. Amen and amen. You may be seated if you care to. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I said praise the Lord. Hallelujah. These are powerful uh, scriptures in the Word of God. Know you not that you are the temple of God. Amen. In the Old Covenant, amen, the presence of the Lord had to dwell in a building in the Holy of Holies or in a tabernacle. It couldn't dwell in man yet because sin had not been taken away. Amen. But after Jesus died on Calvary's cross and he said, it is finished, we see one of the greatest miraculous things happen. The veil is ripped from top to bottom, signifying, amen, from that this time forward with a new covenant, amen, the presence of God will now dwell in man and not in a man-made tabernacle or building, amen. But it'll dwell in a God-made tabernacle. This physical body, amen, that God created when we were in the wombs of our mothers. Amen. 
and God wants this temple, amen, to be a light onto this darkened world, amen. But unfortunately, at the church of Corinth, amen, they were steeped in antinomianism, amen, which it means against law, which in other words, they was using grace as a license to sin. And Paul tries to tell the church at Corinth, don't you know that you are the temple of the living God, amen, that the power and the presence of the Lord dwells in you? I was just thinking as the songs was playing this afternoon, amen, when our son had called from over in San Diego. He finally got to his duty station, amen, and he called Michelle's phone and wanted to talk a few minutes, and Michelle relayed what our son Alden um, was doing, and he was over visiting the zoo and and seeing some of the sites after being in boot camp and then the um, combat, Marine combat training and then going over to his school for two months and then finally being able to take a train and go to his duty station where um, prayerfully and uh, believing that he'll be for the next three and a half years after his um, time is done if he decides not to continue in it. Amen. But something just uh, it just struck my just struck me that the Lord brought it back to our remembrance. Amen. When I was meditating on these scriptures and and Michelle was singing the song, change my heart, oh God. Amen. And thinking about how the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Amen. To make the changes for us. If we'll just evidence simple faith. Amen. But to getting to my story amen, as Alden called on the phone and was uh, saying what he was doing. He says, the strangest thing happened today. Amen. I may not get the story word for word, but you get the idea. He says, I took a cab. Got in the cab. Amen. An Uber. Well, whatever it is. It's called a cab in Ohio. But he got into a cab. And, of course, the driver said, where are you going? And Alden told him the destination. And then the cab driver, he asked, are you a pastor? <laughs> and our son says, no, but my father is. Why? He goes, well, I can just sense the presence of the Lord. I can sense the calling, amen. And I was sitting there, don't you know, amen. I said, don't you know. I said, don't you know that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Don't you know that you are a temple. What the Word of God says is true, amen. If you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you are a temple, amen, for the living God, amen. And when you get around other Christians, amen, you don't even have to say anything. You'll bear witness. You'll know. Because it was one of the greatest gifts that the new covenant paid for, that Christ paid for on the cross, amen. Not only did it Pay the penalty of sin. But it broke the power of sin in our lives as well. Why is that? Because with our sins being taken away, we have the greatest gift now availed to us, which is the third person of the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, amen. And by grace, he goes to work in our lives and in our hearts where sin shall not have dominion over you because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And this is what he was trying to get to the church of Corinth. Amen. Grace does not give us a license to sin. Amen. Which most churches are uh, uh, teaching. The apostate church is teaching. They call it grace revolution. Where we just ignore our sins. Where we just pretend our sins are not there. And that grace covers it all. That wasn't the reason for grace. The reason was for grace was so the Holy Spirit could come in and start doing some work within our hearts and lives, where people would see a Christ-likeness as we walk this thing out by faith. Amen. And he was trying to tell the church at Corinth here, grace does not give us a license to sin. 
Amen. And most of the church world tries to go out to the world and say you need professional help. But let me tell you, the only professional help you need is the Holy Spirit. Amen. Don't you know you have the author of the book dwelling in you. And any problem that you have, he can go to work and fix it because Christ died on the cross so you could have victory tonight. Because the Holy Spirit works exclusively in the blood of Jesus, amen. We cannot get victory through any other means, amen. The church at Corinth was trying to rely on their wisdom of the world, rely on the education of the world, and thought that grace was gives us a license to sin and, and to trust in other things. And he says in verse 18, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool. Amen. I like what the note said. It's not meant to denigrate education, but rather to portray the truth that neither God nor his ways can be found through the wisdom of this world or higher education. Let the person accept the Lord as his Savior and then go to the Word of God to learn about the Lord, which the world thinks is foolish. Well, I was at work as I didn't get to testify this morning, but I'll do it tonight. I, I was at work this last week and uh, it was break time. And I think, give me a tissue. Thank you, honey. And it was our break time. And, of course, we get 20 minutes on our break. And I was walking by to go over to a table where a group was sitting. And a lady said, hey, Brad. I, I stopped where I was and I looked over and I said, yes. And I won't give her name. And she says, you're a pastor, right? And I said, well, yeah, I'm a pastor. And I was, she didn't say nothing at first. So I was going on to start walking away. And she goes, no, sit down for a second. I have a question. I said, oh boy. And I said, this is either going to turn out very good or very bad. Amen. But I prayed for the good. But she says, okay, you're a pastor, right? And I said, well, yes. She goes, you're a Christian, right? And I said, well, yes. And she goes, well, I'm a pagan. I said, okay. And she goes, and I do witchcraft. And I said, okay. And I said, well, what's your question? She goes, well, I know it's not right with God, and I want to do what's right. And I've been talking to this lady across me, and she's Jehovah's Witness. And I said, okay. And she goes, I want to hear your point of view. What am I supposed to do? Should I just clean up my life and just stop practicing witchcraft? She goes, oh, I'm not a witch. I, I just like the witchcraft. I said, okay. And I said, well, I said, first of all, I said, you have to understand that the only way that anything can cl get cleaned up, I said, first of all, you have to be washed in the blood of the lamb. And I said, and you have to be born again. And she goes, you have to be what? I said, born again. I said, saved. And she says, oh, well, what's that? And I said, well. I said, the Holy Spirit comes in, and uh, he starts making the changes, and he starts cleaning you up. Well, what I have to do? And I said, well, I said, you don't have to do anything except accept Christ and believe in what he's done. I'm um, believing that when he died at the cross for your sins, I said, it washed them all away. And I said, just deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. And... I could see over the lady across the table, and you could I could just sense the, the brick wall going up. And I knew she was going to say something. I said, now, I said, you're trying to compare apples to oranges. I said, I'm trying to give you the truth, but she over here, she's going to tell you what the Jehovah's Witness believe. And I said, I've dealt with a few Jehovah's Witnesses. And I said, I know she's going to tell you that, um, that the cross was really a pole and not a T, and that they do not worship the cross. And they teach that true Christians don't worship the cross. And I said, is that correct? And she shook her head yes. And I said, well, that's that's not right, though. I said, you have to realize there's nothing you can do except give it all to Jesus Christ and realize what he's done at the cross. And I said, the Holy Spirit will come in. And I said, he'll start making the changes. 
And she says, well, well, will I have to give up this or will I have to do that? Will I have to do that? I said, just accept what Christ has done. And I said, the Holy Spirit will come in. I said, he'll start leading you. He'll start guiding you. He'll start teaching you. I said, he'll be that small, still voice speaking to you and telling you what's righteous, what's unrighteous, what's godly, what's ungodly. And she says, oh, okay. And then very quickly, the lady, said, well, the lady across the table said, well, I don't believe that you just can't do anything. And you just shouldn't be listening to small voices. <laughs> she goes, that's why God gave us a conscience. And I said, conscience isn't enough. I said, if conscience was enough, why do we have murderers? Why do we have people in jail? Why do we have rapists? Why do we have all these things? Because conscience is not enough. Because sin is more powerful than you or me. I said, we need the grace of God and we need the help of the Holy Spirit. And I said, the only way that works is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And there's many people out there, amen, just like the church of Corinth here who was using grace as a license to sin. And Paul writes to them here at the last part of chapter 3 and says, that's not right. Grace does not give us a license to sin, but grace gives us the ability to live a holy and righteous life because of what Jesus Christ has done at the cross for you and me. By the grace of God, the righteousness of Christ is imputed on to us because of faith in him and through grace that righteousness is imputed onto us which gives the holy spirit the legal right to come in to you and me who are born again who are saved and go to work where sin shall not have dominion over you and me amen But many are still trying to use their own education, their own works, their own talents themselves. And Paul tells the church at Corinth here, you can't use the wisdom of the world to get the things of God. Let me say that again. If you think that the things of the world are going to get you godly things, you're dead wrong. Do you understand that? Amen. If we want to get the things of God, we have to go God's way. It's a narrow way, but it's a good way that will lead to life and life more abundantly, which is through Calvary's cross, which is through the blood of the Lamb, which is through Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Because it's the only way. The Holy Spirit works. And what such a better covenant we have in the new covenant. I can even remember, amen, standing outside the Gilboa uh, parking lot, amen, and there was a minister there. He wasn't the pastor, but he was another minister, amen, that had uh, started attending. And we was out there talking about Moses. And I told the brother, I said, brother, boy, I said, I wish I could be like Moses and speak with the Lord face to face. And he says, brother, you got something better. He says, with Moses, the Lord was three feet away from him talking to him. But guess what? How much closer is the Lord when he's dwelling in you and not just three feet away? <laughs> better covenant, better promises. Amen. Think about that church. Yes, Moses, amen, one of the most humblest men in the Old Testament, spoke with God face to face. Amen. And I don't know how close he ever got to the Lord speaking with him face to face. Amen. Could have been two feet, three feet. But think how much closer we are because of a better covenant with better promises, better terms. Amen. Where we have the Lord dwelling in us. Amen. And not just on a temporary basis like it was with uh, the prophets of old or with certain kings in the Old Testament, but on a permanent basis. I said on a permanent basis. 
Amen. We are a temple for the Lord. Amen. Those in the Old Testament, they was only allowed to go so far into the tabernacle. And after they got to a certain point, they was not allowed to go any further. The only person that was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, amen, where the presence of the Lord dwelled, was the great high priest once a year where he would apply the blood of the, on the mercy seat, and I believe it was during Passover. If anybody else tried going in there at any other time, they would be instantly struck dead. Amen. Think of that. See, we tend to forget that the holiness and the righteousness of the Lord. Yes, the Lord is love, but he's also holiness. He's also righteousness. He's also wrath. Amen. <laughs> and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. And think of that power. Think of that. In the Old Testament, if you went into the tabernacle, you could go through the door, amen, and you would be met with the brazen altar. And then that's where you would sacrifice your lamb. The priest would be able to go into the tabernacle, into the next part. And then right behind the veil of that would be the Holy of Holies where he was not allowed to go. And only the great high priest once a year could go in there. And if anybody else went in there, they would be instantly struck dead, being in the presence of God. Amen. But think of that. When Jesus died at Calvary's cross, it ripped the veil from top to bottom and allowed for any believer, for any believer from that day forth, for any believer for that day forth to be able to go into the presence of the Lord. Amen. What a blessing. What a promise that is. I, so many believers, I just have to say it, take this for granted. Amen. You have a power dwelling in you. Amen. All because of the blood of Jesus. For the, cre for the preaching of the cross is to those who perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. That wonder-working power that is able to change hearts, change lives, dwells in you on a permanent basis and will never leave you nor forsake you. And all we have to do is evidence simple things faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. What a promise, church. I said, what a promise, church. Amen. I don't think some of you are getting this tonight. What a promise, church. Don't you know that you are a temple for the living God and the Holy Spirit dwells in you? And he abides there on a permanent basis. And he's not there so that we can have a license to sin, but to clean us up. Amen. I can guarantee you. <laughs> Think of this. If Brother Swagger came in, amen, and visited our church, <laughs> and he visited with you for the entire day, I guarantee there would be some things you would not want him to see. <laughs> amen think about that i'm just being real tonight folks i can guarantee you amen if brother swag and i'll even say this for my if brother swagger came in or knocked on my door and i'd say come on in amen sbn is playing <laughs> some of the things that i probably do think that Nobody is seeing. I probably wouldn't do. I take the old Super Nintendo and maybe slide it under the couch. <laughs> Scatter out a few Bibles on the table. I mean, come on, folks. I'm just being real tonight. 
Amen. My prayer over the meal when we say, would you like something to eat, would probably be a few more minutes longer <laughs> than what it normally would be. But guess what? There's one even greater than him that's with you every day, every minute, every second. And he's not there. Amen. I said he's not. It would be a whole different story, amen, if, if you could go back and look and see the presence of the Lord. And, and I'll just even say this for many Christians today. If they was able to take a look back in the Old Testament and see the Shania glory that was always on top of that temple or that tabernacle, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night hovering over the holy of holies. Amen. And you would see the, the brazen altar with the blood all around it. And you would smell the stench of burning carcass of a lamb being offered up all day and all night. You would know that the power of God is not something to play around with. And if you would see the fire, when, if somebody was doing, if one of the priests was doing something wrong in the tabernacle, and you would see the fire of God come and just burn them. If many Christians would look at that and realize that they would have a whole new respect for the presence of the Lord that's dwelling in them. Amen. <laughs> Think about that, church. Amen. That same power that was dwelling over the tabernacle of old is dwelling in you. And this is what he was trying to get to at the church of Corinth. Think of that. That power that dwelled over the tabernacle, that power... When there was several priests, when they did something wrong and the Lord was displeased with it and the fire shot out of the Holy of Holies and burnt them to a crisp where people would see it. Think of that. That same presence, that same power dwells in you and me. Amen. And when we read the Old Testament and what it foreshadowed, and we see the glory and the holiness and the righteousness that was in the Holy of Holies, the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, it should give us a whole new respect here for 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know you not that you are the temple of God. And that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. See, sin eats away at our faith. Amen. If we, and there are many who come to the Lord, and they'll get wondrously born again. But if they start using grace as a license to sin, what we see with most believers, if they get into false doctrine, especially this grace revolution, what happens is it'll eat away at their faith. See, sin never stays stagnant. It'll always eat away at our faith until nothing's left, until it destroys us. We see that in James chapter 1, I believe it's verse 14, that we're drawn away by the lusts of the flesh, amen? And as we're drawn away by the lusts of the flesh, amen, sin is conceived, and the end result of sin is death, amen? If we use grace as a license to sin, that sin will eventually start, that sin that the power of sin will eventually eat away at our faith, eroding it until there's nothing left, until we walk away from the faith. Amen. And it's nothing to play around with. Amen. We are to be a temple for the living God, and we are to give up. A... I 
I said, we are to give up. I said, we are to give up spiritual sacrifices, which is faith in the blood of Jesus Christ on a daily basis. So the power and the presence of the Lord that dwells in us can clean us up. Amen. Where sin shall not have dominion over you and me. And he tells the church at Corinth, don't be deceived. Amen. If you think you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool. Realizing, amen, this is not about you and me, but it's all about the Lord. And to we are to be a light and a salt in this world. And that we are a temple for the living God, for him to dwell in us, amen. And he tells them, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. See, the world thinks the cross is foolishness. But guess what? The Lord says the wisdom of this world is the foolish things. Let me say that again. You got to get that tonight, amen. The world thinks that the blood of Jesus Christ is foolish. Thinks it's dumb, thinks it's stupid. How can one be changed by believing in a man that died 2,000 years ago who claims to be raised from the dead? That sounds foolish. The world says you have to do something. You have to change yourself. You have to modify yourself. You have to rehabilitate yourself. It just can't be that simple. But Paul tells them, If you think you're wise in this world and think those things are going to change you, you're dead wrong. You need to be a fool, amen, and just trust in the blood of Jesus Christ because what God looks at, when he sees the wisdom of this world, when he looks at churches trusting in self-helps, when he sees churches trusting in psychology, When he sees churches trusting in other things other than faith and the blood of Jesus Christ, let's just see what the Lord thinks of it. It says, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. I'll just bluntly say it. Amen. A.K.A. God says, if you're trusting in self-helps, that's stupid. That's what foolishness means. It's what the Word of God says. That's not my words. That's the Lord's words. Amen. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He takes the wise in their own craftiness. Churches trusting in psychology. Trying to rehabilitate yourself. According to the word of God in 1 Corinthians here, the Lord thinks that's stupid. That's just being blunt. Amen. I'm not trying to be mean or belittle people's motives, but we have to understand here, nothing else will work but the blood of Jesus, amen, because the Lord sees everything else that the world tries to come up with, whatever fad it is, as foolishness. It won't work. If it's not the blood of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is not in it, and it will not work. Amen. Because he says, therefore, let no man glory in men. See, the Lord says that no flesh shall glory in his presence, amen, and to rejoice in other men rather than what Christ has done at the cross is evil. It's devilish, amen. It's sin. That's what real sin is, is when you place your faith in something else other than Christ and what he's done at the cross. That is the sin. Amen. Do you understand that? That's what real sin is. The acts of sin that follow is just a manifestation of the flesh showing that your faith is misplaced somewhere. Do you understand that? 
Let me say that again. The real sin that many believers do is placing their faith in something else other than the blood of Jesus Christ. And what they're doing is they're placing it in themselves or in another man. Even if you call that other man a Jesus, it's still another Jesus, it's still another gospel, and it's still another spirit. And guess what? Christ won't get the glory. Either you're going to get the glory yourself or other men are going to get the glory. And the Lord says, don't do that because no flesh shall glory in my presence. So don't glory in other men. Amen. But that's where the real sin is, placing our faith in something else other than the blood of Jesus Christ. And because we place our faith somewhere else, that's the real sin. Amen. And what we're doing is we're looking to man or ourselves. And what in reality that is, is walking after the flesh. And guess what? We see in Galatians, if we walk after the flesh, the manifestations that's going to happen. Fornification, revelings. Amen. Drunkardness, murder, envies, and everything else that follows in Galatians chapter 5, I believe, verse 19. I could be wrong on that. But I know it's in Galatians chapter 5. Amen. And the Lord is trying, and, and Paul tries to tell the church at Corinth here, don't glory in these things. Amen. And the blood of Jesus Christ is not just a side note for us to have as a license to sin. But he says, don't you realize you are the temple of the living God? Amen. The power and the presence, amen, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. That same presence that dwelt over the tabernacle of old now dwells in you. And it's something we shouldn't take lightly. And he tries to tell them at the end of chapter 3. God, don't play favorites. It don't matter if it's Paul. It don't matter if it's Paulos. It don't matter if it's Peter. It don't matter if it's Peter, James, John. It don't matter if it's Brad, Michelle, Shirley, Violet, Kevin, Ruth. It don't matter because it's the same Holy Spirit, the same presence, the same third part of the triune of God. Amen dwelling in you and he won't play favorites and whatever you have need of is yours amen because you are christ and christ is god's that power and that that presence dwells there for a reason for whatever you have need of i like that look at the last two verses here in chapter three he says, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, that means Peter, or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. Amen. Because you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. He don't play favorites. Whatever you have need of, he will give it to you because his son has died for it so you can have it. So you can have life and life more abundantly. And again, the only stipulation that Paul tries to get to them is that it's got to be in the will of God. Amen. Because he starts out telling them, it doesn't give you a license to sin. So that doesn't mean that we can go out and God's going to give us anything that's a sin. Gambling's a sin. Amen. You can pray all day long and have the presence of the Lord, and being a born-again Christian, having the Holy Spirit dwell there, and pray to the Lord and say, I want to hit the lotto. God won't be in it. It's got to be in the will of God. Amen. But if it's in the will of God, having victory over sin is in the will of God. Your calling is in the will of God. Your healings are in the will of God. Amen. Your family coming to the Lord is in the will of God. Whatever you have need of that's in the will of God, the Lord says, it's all yours. I don't play favorites. God is no respecter of persons. I don't care if you're Paul. I don't care if you're Peter. I don't care if you're Apollos. It don't matter because the same Holy Spirit dwells in all of them and dwells in you. And whatever you have need of is yours because you are Christ and Christ is God. Don't you know that you are a temple of the living God where the Holy Spirit dwells? 
dwells in you. And it's not just for us to have a license of sin, but so that we can live a holy and righteous life. And sin shall not have dominion over you and me. And whatever you ask the Lord, he says, it is yours. And that's what Paul tries to get here at the end of chapter 3. You see, in all of chapter 3, first of all, he says, boys, you're carnal. You're trusting in yourselves. You're trusting in what you do. And then he goes through the middle of chapter 3, which we went over this morning, and says, true, we are to labor, but it doesn't merit you or earn you any holiness or righteousness. You'll get rewards for your labor, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't make you more holy or righteous. Amen. Because he says, don't you know, you have one dwelling in you that will give you whatever you have need of by grace. Amen. Because Christ died for all your benefits as well as with your salvation. And it's not just for a license to sin. But it's so our heart can be changed. Amen. So we can be molded. And changed into the likeness of Christ. And that's really, when we see this, that's what our prayer should be. Change my heart, oh God. Amen. May I be like you. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He says that in chapter 3 at the end. Don't you know? That you are the temple of God. And the Spirit of God dwells in you. You have a wonder-working power dwelling in you. Whatever sin or whatever bondage or whatever you're dealing with, you don't have to overcome it on your own. Don't you know the Holy Spirit dwells in you and He will help you with that if you will just evidence faith in the blood of Jesus Christ? It don't matter who you are. It don't matter if you're Paul, Peter, James, John, Brad, Michelle, Brother Swagger, Brother Kurt, whoever you, it don't matter. God's no respecter of persons. Amen. The same Holy Spirit that dwelt in them dwells in you. And whatever you have need of is yours. If you'll just lay it down at the foot of the cross, the Holy Spirit will go to work because you are Christ's. And Christ is God's. Amen. And so whatever you have need of tonight, whatever the problem may be, whatever the issue may be, whatever the sin may be, whatever the bondage is, it don't matter because the answer is the same. You have a power dwelling in you that will help you. Amen. And the only thing you have to do. Amen. You know using it as a, using the grace of God as a license to sin is wrong. You know that. It's time to submit it at the foot of the cross. You have a power dwelling in you that will free you from whatever that issue is. Why? Because Christ already paid for it. Just give up spiritual sacrifices in the blood of Jesus Christ. Just lay it at the feet of Jesus and by faith just believe and tell the Lord I believe that I can have victory over this because the blood was shed so that I could be free. And the Holy Spirit by grace will go to work and free you. It may instantly just be gone. Or the Lord may test your faith a little. Amen. But if you fight the good fight of faith, I guarantee you the day will come where that sin shall not have dominion over you. And all the, law, all the Lord's looking for is for you to just cry out to him, believing in the blood, and just say, Lord, change my heart. Make it ever true. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Amen. Would you stand tonight? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your word tonight and for your presence that we can sense. We're so thankful that your Holy Spirit dwells in us. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Lord, thank you. Just cry out to him tonight. Change my heart, Lord God. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. You are the I am the clay. 
image of your son, Jesus Christ, Father. We just ask you would go with us tonight, Father. Be with each and every single one of us, Lord. Let this word, Lord, be engrafted into our hearts, Lord God, on good ground. And, Lord, let it bring forth fruit a hundredfold. We just thank you for your anointing tonight, Lord God. Without it, we, it, we would have nothing. And, Lord, we just with you, we have everything. And we just thank you. We give you the praise and we give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We thank you for joining us at His Light Ministries tonight. Hallelujah.